Okay. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for attending um, for this talk and uh, all the talks of today. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, sums of powers of numbers. Um, just to make this uh, imme immediately clear, these powers will be positive integers. Okay, so uh, they won't be negative, so there will be no Riemann zeta function or something like that. And they won't be um, uh, fractional either. Okay, so k is one, two, three, four, and so on. So, first, a little bit of history. Um, I'm going to denote this by s and k, by the way, so the sum of the first n powers of k is denoted as s and k. Um, this sum was known for k is one, two, and three for quite a long time. Um, Archimedes knew it, uh, Pythagoras knew it probably. There's also Nicomachus who actually found the sum for k is three, the sum of cubes. Um, uh, but kind of after k is three, when, when they try to find k is four, five, six, and so on, um, it, it was proving to be a bit difficult. Uh, the first person who made quite a lot of progress on this uh, problem was Faul Haber, okay, in 1631, who found a formula for this section up to k is 17, which is quite a big feat. Okay, remember that uh, back then there were no computers, no calculators, and so on. So if you think about it, um, if you put k is 17 here, even if you sum up only two terms, you have two to the 17 minus one, which is already a huge number, let alone if you sum up more terms. But Fal Haber actually found all these formulae up to 17. And briefly, the way he did it is quite strange, actually. Uh, he started from the sum of the first n terms where the power is one, okay? And um, which is, as you know, half n and plus one. That's the formula for when k is one. And then from here, he found all the odd powers up to 17. And he just, pro he just wrote these formulae. And the interesting thing is that he wrote down the formulae in terms of a, so in terms of this sum, not in terms of n. So for example, the sum of cubes is a squared. We, we know this, right? That the sum of cubes is actually the square of the sum of the numbers. And then the sum of the fifth power is in terms of a squared as well. In fact, it's a squared times something. And so is the sum of the seventh powers. It's a squared times something. And in fact, this continues up till, up till um, uh, k 17. And then to find the evens, he, he, do, he discovered that if you know the formula for the odd power, which is always, as I said, a squared times some polynomial in a, okay, then the previous um, power, which would be even, of course. So if you know, for example, this formula for case three, from this, you find the formula for case two, the sum of squares. And uh, according to how to, to follow Haber, it's always in terms of a, and 2n plus 1 will always have a 2n plus 1 as, a, as one of the factors. And also, this is in terms of a. So this, these are not in terms of n. Paul Harper did not discover these in terms of n. He discovered these in terms of a, of all formulae. The problem is that Paul Harper did not generalize this result. He just wrote down these uh, formulae up to 17. And he didn't even say how to found these formulae, OK? But for sure, he must have had a way because it's, it's impossible to find the sum of the first uh, 17, you know, the power, the 17 powers without actually having a way to find it. But at the time when you, when, at the time when you publish something, um, the, the proofs weren't very rigorous. Um, for them, if, if you show that you found it for the first 17, it means that it, it continues to work, so, sort of. Um, they didn't have that uh, rigid proof writing that we had today. Actually, Jacobi, more than 200 years later, tried to generalize his results, and his generalization actually um, was then proven by Jacobi himself. 
1654, Pascal found a recurrent relation to generate these uh, um, expressions, which we today call Pascal's identity. For example, here, if we put k is zero, we find immediately an expression for s and zero, which is obvious, by the way, it's just n, because you're summing up one to the zero, two to the zero, three to the zero, which is just one plus one plus one up to n, so that's n. And then when you put k is one, you find the expression in terms of s n zero and that's n one, from which you find that's n one. When you put uh, m is two, you find uh, an expression containing S n zero, S n one, S n two, so I find S n two and so on. So there is a recurrent relation that gives you every formula you want. But uh, the most important, I think, development was done by Jacob Bernoulli in 1713. Actually, uh, it was done before that, but it was published in 1713. Uh, unfortunately, Jacob Bernoulli was dead in 1713, so this was published after his death. Um, and he found an explicit formula for S and K, which is this one. Okay, uh, he noticed that the the sum is always a polynomial in N of degree K plus one. Okay, the coefficient of the of uh, the, the leading coefficient is always one on K plus one. Interestingly, something that I didn't know until recently. The second, uh, the, the coefficient of n to decay is always half, it's always half, okay? And then the rest are in terms of what are nowadays called Bernoulli numbers after, of course, Jacob Bernoulli. Incidentally, uh, here I'm insisting on calling him Jacob Bernoulli because uh, as you might, might know, Bernoulli, there were many more Bernoullis that are famous, uh, perhaps Johann Bernoulli, which is his, uh, brother, who is his brother, um, also has quite a few, um, in, uh, he did quite, quite uh, important work in mathematics as well. So when I talk about Bernoulli, I always uh, specifically name him as well so that I distinguish between the different Bernoulli that existed and that uh, contributed to science and mathematics. But here, Bernoulli number is referring to Jacob Bernoulli because he um, discovered these numbers, which are um, these coefficients. In fact, later on, they will be the coefficients of this formula. So these, are, I don't know if you're seeing them, but these are the first uh, 10. So some of the, of the first k numbers on the first n squares and n cubes and um, uh, fourth powers and so on until the 10th powers. And as you're seeing, they are all polynomials in N of degree K plus one, depending on uh, what the power is. So in this case, it's degree two, this degree three, degree four, degree five, and so on, okay? And this, uh, you can find uh, every one of these as you want. A few properties, as I said, it's a polynomial in N of degree K plus one. Um, uh, the constant term is always zero. In, in every in every uh, polynomial in, in every uh, one of these, the, the reason is because if you sum up zero terms, the answer is always zero. So that so immediately the constant term must be zero. Um, if k is odd, if the power is odd and k is at least three, then the coefficient of n is also zero. Okay, so the the last coefficient, so to speak, would be that of n squared, which is non-trivial, the, the one of 4n, and the constant term will always be zero. So this is not just true for the cubes, it's also true for the fifths and so on. This is actually something that Paul Haber discovered, so to speak, but he only discovered it up till case 17. And we said this as well, that uh, the leading coefficient is one on k plus one. This is Strange, but uh, I, I repeat it because for me it's not obvious at all that the next coefficient is always half for every um, sum, except of course for k is zero when the power is zero because that's just n. But otherwise, all of the others will have the second coefficient will be half. The coefficients sum to one. This is because when you put n is one, um, the sum is always one because it's just one to the power of k which is one. So when you put n is one, you're just summing up the coefficients at the end of the day, okay? 
Uh, also, these, are, these two are thanks to foul harbor as well. If the power is even, then the formula will contain n, n plus one, and two n plus one as factors always. And if the power is odd and k is at least c, then the formula will contain n squared and then plus one squared as factors always. Okay. Now I am keeping this a tiny result. If I sum up n minus one terms instead of n terms, you get exactly the same formula except that half, that second coefficient, which is half, will be a minus half instead. And the reason for this is very, very simple. The reason is because this, this minus n to decay, of course, because I'm not ending up n to decay. So the coefficient of n to decay is decreased by one. So from half, it becomes minus half. That's it. That's very, um, that's a very simple proof. Of course, assuming that we have proved beforehand that the second coefficient is always half, right? Um, later on, we shall uh, do two sketches of this proof, really. And this means that if you sum up n minus one terms, the coefficient will sum to zero, right? Because uh, this coefficient was decreased by one. So if before the sum was one, now the sum of the coefficients will be zero if you sum up n minus one terms. I'm saying this because um, in this method, I'm actually going to find the sum of the first n terms by first finding the sum of the first n minus one term. And then just saying that this coefficient instead of half, instead of minus half, just write it down as half, and you will be finding the, um, uh, the sum of the first n terms immediately. But this also gives um, historically two different Bernoulli number sequences. They are exactly identical, except one of them uh, has b1 is minus half, and the other one b1 is half. Otherwise, they are identical. Um, uh, and this is because you could consider this as, as being because um, this one, this minus half, is when you sum up n minus one terms, and this half is when you sum up n terms. Okay, so let's now describe the first way of, first strange way perhaps of getting to these. So first I start with this result. Um, this is quite straightforward actually what I've done here is I took k plus one to the m and expanded it using Pascal triangle but here I put the last term which should be m choose then k to the m I just put it on the right hand side and you get this okay and now I wrote this in a matrix now uh, what I did here really is the first row here is just this result when m is one, okay? The second row is the same result when m is two. The third row is the same result when m is three, until uh, you have m rows. So you can go downwards as much as you wish, okay? And you get this lower triangular matrix, which when you multiply by this uh, uh, column matrix, you get this. Of course, you get uh, these uh, right-hand sides when I miss one, when I miss two, when I miss three, and when I miss them as well, right? Uh, just like this formula. And I'm going to call this this uh, um, matrix PM, okay? So this will be an M by M matrix. And th th I'm going to call it PM, as I said, it's lower triangular. Also clearly it is uh, invertible because its determinant is, this, is the product of its uh, diagonal entries which are all not zero. And in fact, these are precisely one, two, three, four, up to M. So when you multiply them out, you just get M factorial, right? So clearly this is invertible and that will be important later. Now, what I did here in this slide, um, instead of writing down K to the zero, K to the one and so on here, I just wrote the sum from K is one to N minus one of all of them. And of course, when you do that, you get also the sum from k equals n minus one also on the right hand side for all of these. But the point is that each of these is when you when you expand it, you get the method of differences. For example, for the first one, you get uh, minus one plus three minus two plus four minus three. So all of them cancel except the, the k plus one um, 
the n minus one here when you put n minus one here and one here so for this you get uh, n minus one in fact for this one using the exact same um, argument you will get n squared minus one for this one you'll get n cubed minus one and so on and for this one you get n to the n minus one which is what i'm writing here by the way, these are precisely the sums that we want to find, all right? The formula for is want to find, but we're finding only the sum of the first n minus one term. Remember, though, that this is not a problem. The formula is exactly the same, except that you change the minus half to half. And, and, and uh, the, you, you just um, adjust it very easily. So that matrix times this uh, vector is equal to this. And now I'm going to rewrite this like this, right? I just put the minus, since all of these are minus one, I wrote n to the one, et cetera, along, and this vector of all ones along. And now comes a little trick, okay? Um, this vector of all ones is actually the first column of PM. This, this matrix, all, all of the first, uh, the, the numbers of all of the first column are all one, right? One to zero, one to zero, one. So this is all one. So here I can rewrite this as PM times one and the rest are zero. And this will give me the first column of PM. The reason I'm doing this is that now I put this on this side and I get this. Okay. And now I'm, I'm ready, basically, because now I just put PM on the other side and it becomes the inverse. And this is telling me that if I find the, the inverse matrix of, this, uh, of the matrix I, I started with, that triangular matrix, when I multiply by n, n squared, n cubed, and so on, all that happens is that um, the, the coefficients n or the, the terms n squared and cubed and so on will be inserted next to each number. So basically, this matrix contains precisely the coefficients that I want. For example, if I start from this one, the inverse will be this. And this gives me exactly the coefficients I want. For example, the second row tells me that the sum of the squares is minus half n plus half n squared of the first n minus one terms, okay? The sum of the first, uh, so sorry, this, this is the sum of the, of, the, of the one power plus two plus three after n minus one. This is the sum of squares, which is one sixth n minus one half n squared plus one third n cubed. This is the sum of cubes, which is one fourth n squared minus one half n cubed plus one fourth n to the fourth, and so on, okay? So if you want to find um, the sum of the, of the fifth powers, you just make this a five point matrix and read the last line, basically, and you find the coefficient. And note as well that uh, here, all of these coefficients are minus half, as I said uh, before. Note that if you want to prove that each of these is minus half, you can, I'm not going to do it here, but you can find the adjoint or the adjugate matrix of this, and then just consider um, these terms, these entries here. Remember that they're on when you find the inverse, you actually find the transpose of the, of the adjoint and then define, divide by the determinant, which is m factorial, remember? And you should get always that these will be minus m factorial on two. So that when you divide by m factorial, all of these will be minus one. So that's the first method. Now, the second method is very strange. It's very, very weird, okay? Extremely so, in fact, I would say. But I'm going to show it to you anyway. Um, this is, there's nothing weird about this, uh, this, this line that I wrote here, by the way, okay? Uh, what I'm saying here is that if I sum up the first 10 terms and subtract the first n minus one terms, of course, I end up with n to the k. And for the k plus one powers, of course, I end up with n to the k plus one. That's nothing, nothing weird about that. But the strange thing is this. 
that I'm going to write n to the k plus one as the integral of n to the k, which is n to the k plus one on k plus one times k plus one. Of course, here I'm ignoring the process of integration, which is already a bit dodgy, but I'm going to propose to actually find my um, formulae by integrating, okay? By integration. Okay, let's see how, how we're going to do this. Okay, so since this is true, I'm going to say maybe, maybe the formula for the k plus one powers, maybe if I differentiate it, I get the formula for the k powers and k plus one because of this, maybe. Let's see if it's, if, if it's true. If this were true, then if I differentiate this, according to this, I would get this, right? According to um, this thing that I'm proposing, you get this. And then since this is n to the k, you just get k plus one n to the k, which is the derivative of n to the k plus one. So I'm saying that the derivative of this is the derivative of this. So when two functions have the same derivatives, they are identical up to a constant, right? They are identical up to a constant. So really, I'm not that far off. I'm not that far off. So if I, if I were to use this definition, then these two functions would differ by a constant. Unfortunately, I want them to match exactly. But actually, it's almost there. It's almost there. I just need to adjust it slightly for this constant. Okay, I want them to be exactly the same, unfortunately. Okay, so let's adjust it slightly. I'm just going to add a constant then. So my first proposal was this. Let's just add a constant and retry. Let's try this again. If I try this again, this time I get this and the constant cancels and I get then exactly the same thing as before. So this works this time because even though I got exactly the same thing as before, but now I have this constant that I will adjust to make it correct, okay? And perhaps the question will be, how will, how will you then adjust the constant to find the correct constant? Using the fact that if you sum up only one term, the answer is always one because it will be one to the k or one to the one squared, one cube, one to the fourth, it will always be one. So from here, I can find my t, okay? And by the way, this t is actually um, the Bernoulli number that Bernoulli was um, wanted to find for his formula. Okay, so what I'm saying now, um, I'm going to say that s and k plus one is the integral of, of this, sorry, the, the red one, okay? So the integral of c is cn, and the integral of this will be k plus one times the integral of x and k. So we get this. And we're going to ignore the cosmos of integration. Why? Because my constant then, the, the c that I have, which is actually the Bernoulli number, will be adjusted whatever cosmos of integration you write, okay? Uh, by the way, if you want to write an integral without the cosmos of integration, since this happens to be a polynomial, I can just write down this and you get exactly the integral you want without the cosmos of integration. So the integral from zero to n. And then to find the k plus one, I substitute n is one in this and I get the k plus one times one plus k plus one times the integral from zero to one with this. And note that this is actually the sum of the coefficients. And we know that the sum of coefficients is one, and in fact, here we're proving it again because one is equal to the sum of the coefficients. So this is um, a recurrence relation using integration, but this looks messy. So let me show you um, practically how this works. This is the last slide, by the way, okay? So, so let me start with the simplest formula, um, one to the zero plus two to the zero plus three to the zero and so on, that's n. If I sum up the first n of these. So let's find now one to the one plus two to the one plus three to the one and so on. How do we do it? So first I integrate this formula. Okay, and I get half n squared plus k. Very easy. So s n one will be some constant times n plus one times this integral that I've just found. I'm ignoring the cost of integration. 
and C is such that the coefficient sums to one. And in this case, since this is half and squared, this must also be half. So that's half plus half is one. And that's the formula for one plus two plus three up to n. And that's it. Let's find the sum of squares. So I integrate the formula for the sum of first powers, and I get one fourth n squared plus one six n q plus k. I ignore the concept of integration, and I say that the sum of squares is some number times n plus twice this, so that the coefficient sums to one. And since these are half n squared and one third n cube, I need a one sixth here so that these fractions sum to one. And that is in fact the formula for the sum of squares. Let's do it again. This is the sum of cubes. I integrate this function and I get this. And once again, I say that the sum of cubes must be some number times n times three times this polynomial. And since uh, I want this coefficient coming to one, in this case, c must be zero because one fourth plus one half plus one fourth happens to be zero already. So, sorry, it happens to be one already. So c here is zero. So we get the formula for the cubes. And you can continue doing so. As, you, as you're noticing, it's very, very simple here to find the sum of the fourth power. So we just integrate this. Uh, you add that the n, and then uh, you multiply this, the, the integral by four and make sure that the sum of, of the coefficients is one. And that's it. I hope that you have enjoyed my talk. <laughs>